Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldkamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today, we're going to continue with the interview we have with Dr. Joan Ifland, who is the one of the world experts, if not the world expert, on processed foods and the effect that processed foods have on our brains. It's much deeper than you think it would be. It's not just about the quality of food. It's about, in essence, these very scientifically designed chemicals, additives, that have been put into food and a lot of absolutely devoid of nutrition food meant to taste great. Think of Doritos for one, something you just want to eat bag after bag after bag. Why is that? Some of you might think, oh, it's because of the salt. It's because of this, it's because of that. Well, you're partially right, but it's, there's a whole science behind making the mix just sweet enough, but not too sweet, salty enough, not too salty, fatty enough, And then you have all the other compounds that were created that hadn't even pre-existed before that are added to that as well. So it's a big category of food, and it's really post-World War II in the sense that it's really the industrialization of the food industry that, as we've covered in the first episode in talking with Joan, and that the tobacco companies, when they realized their cigarette industry really was not going to be, was losing profitability. So where else could they take their expertise? So they didn't just harvest cigarettes and roll them into cigarettes and package them so everybody could smoke them. They added a lot of stuff to make cigarettes addicting. So it's not just the tar and nicotine. It's far beyond that. Many, 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 many other chemicals have been added to cigarettes, and that's what cigarettes are today. I don't know about cigars. I could be a whole different thing. But anyway, you got tar and nicotine in the very least. So they took their expertise and they bought food companies. This all happened in the mid-80s, as we discussed. And the expertise, the science behind it, it's now been 40 years of setting the interplay of whatever chemicals they can make And however, it affects neurotransmitters, obviously in non-humans, but they do taste tests. So what has come along, certainly since the 90s, is realizing now that we can study the brain more intimately, we get to see what parts of the brain light up when certain foods are ingested, when certain foods are simply even visually seen and not ingested. And so this whole pathway of what is the progression of having a processed food that one has had before and how it becomes highly desirable in the whole process. And and why is it with processed foods? And we're going to say carbohydrates in general fit into this category as well, because there is a carbohydrate addiction. Certainly you can think of refined carbohydrates as an addiction. Sugar fits into that. And there's even books written on the same thing, but we're talking pretty much about the same pathways, nuanced only slightly if it's caused by additives versus the refined carbohydrates. So you think of the wheat, refined wheats, this has the same thing. So it's all that processed food. You're not eating the whole grains right off the, what do you call it, stalk of wheat. 
So the thought came to me, you know, you can go on and on about information and I find it all very fascinating, but sometimes too much information tends to just stop people from listening of what the bigger picture is and becomes an obstacle to them simply implementing some basic ideas. This is not and this is not a criticism of Joan. I'm saying that I love information. I tend to pile on more and more and more. And there's a point that you need to sort of simplify it to get the message out so people can act on it in a healthy way. So one of the aids you use is either an analogy or a metaphor. So my metaphor, I'm I'm currently working on a program. So metaphors are certainly a way of simplifying complex ideas. And so in this case, I thought of the idea of greyhound racing dogs, apart from the idea that greyhounds are not treated well to be uh, to race, and it's a horrible story. The illustration is appropriate in this regard. To train a greyhound, which they do chase rabbits and animals and so on and so forth, but to make them consistently chase a rabbit-like thing from puppyhood to doghood and then they retire is that they have to, if you've ever been to a greyhound track, and right now I'm actually looking at pictures of this so I can refine my words on this, that these dogs have been trained initially on a rabbit, but then it goes to a fake rabbit. They're chasing a, a rag, in essence, that has been soaked with so much neurotransmitter stimulating chemicals, i.e. additives, just like that are put in food, they are chasing this soaked, saturated rag. It's a small little pillow about the size of a rabbit that's on a pole that goes whipping around in front of the running greyhounds. Obviously running, it goes faster than the greyhounds and the greyhounds can never catch this. So, but they had to be trained on these particular scents, on, on to react to these particular chemicals. And so most do, so it's a majority thing, but there are some that just don't and they're simply called out and they end up not being racing dogs. But the metaphor is that that's, that, that this particular fake rabbit saturated with these particular chemicals are stimulating in the brains of these greyhounds a motivation, a willingness to act impulsively without thinking of anything else. It's almost like an emergency because they have a sense of a super reward. If they catch the thing, it's not just catching a rabbit. It's catching the, the Val, it's the Valhalla of rabbits. It's the highest, most, it's better than sex for these dogs. It is the top of the top of the top in terms of a reward system. So the whole reward system, neurologically speaking, has a lot to do with dopamine and creating a dopamine release. So in humans, we have the same thing. I don't know if we'll be chasing these particular rabbits around the track, but we have other rabbits in our own life. And these other rabbits, these fake rabbits, are processed foods. And so we create these things, processed foods, uh, for some Now I'm speaking about addiction. All addictions tend to really light up the dopamine pathway. And you can see that on spec scans and so on. And what is also interesting is that there's the science behind these additives is that they decrease the neurotransmission, the pathways that go to the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the, well, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Let's think about this particular action. So it shuts down any sort of self-awareness or even self-doubt about this impulsive feel that you've got. Now what you have is all crew on deck. Let's just get this thing going. And there's not a voice in your head that says, let's not do this. So there's no second doubts. There's no hesitation. It's impulsive. and And that's what addiction is. It gets to be so the reward is so perceived in your mind because of past experiences, it looks forward to the next one, the next dopamine release, et cetera, et cetera. And it gets a little more complicated than that for sure, but that's primarily it. It's all about the reward system and it scientifically has been designed to shut down 
the secondary systems that make you consider other choices and really is just the best plan of action to do it. So you're all or nothing in one direction. That's addiction. And you can trace that. So when you go into the spec scans, you can see your prefrontal cortex is not lighting up. There's no, th there's no thinking about, maybe we shouldn't do this. And it's light bulb bright in terms of the reward system. So that's a big deal. So the analogy is with processed foods is that they are triggers. They are meant to be the best trigger and to get you going in one direction only and to keep coming back and coming back, to keep eating it and eating it and not to be aware of any of the consequences of this particular action that you are taking. So that's part of it. The other part of processed foods is the fact that, you know, these are toxins. These are not natural items. Some of them, I mean, you go sugar, fat, and um, salt, you know, they obviously have existed in the world. So you have receptors for these and sad snarl, but the concentrations has never been these high. So this whole idea that these are natural substances on a, on a very short list, by the way, of, that I'm talking about, are in such high concentration that they too are part of the problem. So natural or unnatural, synthetic or found in nature is not so much a moot point. It's the concentration of all these that creates this blind rage to get this reward of this thing focused on food. So that's the world of addiction. And that's what additives in foods drive. And that's why there's so much money being put into uh, various supplements and additives, certainly the alternative sugars, the uh, artificial sugars, and they have plenty of problems. And they're some people say they're lethal. They certainly are problematic. I'll say that. It's been well documented. Another topic that we covered a long time ago. Okay, so you have that. The other thing is they're basically toxin. So after you are eating them, you've ingested them and so on, what does your body do with it? So there's that whole second part of you're eating toxins. This is not normal. Your body has not evolved to deal with these things. Um, and so these are two aspects of processed foods that really have to be dis talked, talked about. They certainly are not going to be disclosed by the manufacturers. They certainly are not going to be disclosed by the FDA. They certainly are not going to be disclosed by the companies that manufacture the, the uh, various additives. So that's the world we live in. There's a lot of, in essence, self-responsibility for you to go, gosh. So what does that mean? Well, interesting, back to talking to Dr. Iflin is that, so how do you, if that's the problem, how do you get people to treat the problem, to become aware of it? How do you move from no awareness to a little bit of awareness to associating certain contexts with a better outcome? You know, they can take a beat, they can start thinking about these things, and that's the beginning of it. And so she has developed a, a program of people being face-to-face -face for a number of hours per day many days a week because they need that reinforcement by each other, looking at other people in the group. So now she does this on Zoom, which is, it's like the 12 step program. You're all in the same room and you're looking around the room and you're seeing other people making the same kind of, doing the same kind of work to come to the same kind of decision. So uh, that's called mirroring or mirroring neurons. And it's a whole nother part of the brain. So you're trying to unhook it from the addictive brain and hook it back into associating yourself with better outcomes and better people, better habits, certainly better dietary habits and so on. So I'll leave it at that. But I just think this whole idea of processed food addiction is almost, in my, it's, it's, it's almost quelled. I think it's purposely pushed aside and not discussed because it's complicated and people don't want to think that they personally have an addiction to processed foods or an addiction to name your thing that's dietary in this particular regard. So, but they do. And it really needs to, this, this, this discussion needs to be opened because it causes a kind of self-awareness to think that our other choices to be made in your life and in my life that serve you better than these stupid food things we're eating called processed foods and think that they're serving us. They're not serving us at all. They're hurting us. So getting to the point of reconsidering the choices we're making about food is a very, very, very big deal. So enough said on that. I hope you enjoy part two and there'll probably be a part three. 
I find that it is such rich information from a person who wrote the textbook on uh, food addiction. So until next time, this is Dr. Goldcamp signing off. Yeah. Interesting. A couple of comments. One is um, back when I was in Seattle, not far from where you are, more or less you are in Seattle, part of our uh, um, med school training elective was to work with uh, drug addicts. So Mm -hmm. I went downtown to work with uh, methadone. Well, methadone was given out in lieu of whatever, you know, the heroin and the opium. So um, I was in the acupuncture program. And so you had an elective to go in and do auricular acupuncture and uh, which is not all that sophisticated, but it's five points in both years. And you'd have to show up from four o'clock to in the morning, four o'clock to, I think it was eight o'clock. And people would come in. It's like going to a library, very quiet. They'd have a little file and you go, Bob, how are you doing? You know, and you see the points, maybe you had a few other points, but it was basically they're, they're dressed. They're about to go to work. And you put the auricular points in, they would sit there. Most of them would kind of pass out because it would tranquilize. And so the the point of all this was when people would say, why do you do this? Why do they come? And you'd see attorneys there too. So it wasn't just because they're on the methadone treatment. It was because they admitted they have a problem. They need to address it and they were allowed to come in. And so what, what we were told and what we learned is that it wasn't anything that miraculous. It didn't sort of connect to the greater acupuncture in Chinese medicine, but this was, it actually... Gave them, and we would say, gave them a moment of consciousness, so they are more aware of their choices to where to go from there. And so they would come back every day. So it was uh, seven days a week, and we'd have to do it for six months. So it was quite a commitment on our side because you go back to wherever school you had. But wow. you know, and it was inner city there, and so it was a real eye opening that this little thing, you know, close on do the alcohol, put in the points. They actually were trained to take their points out to go up and swab the ears out so you only had to put them in and you'd see them and get to know their stories because you have to check in for five minutes maybe every day and this whole transition i'm thinking this there's something bigger than just these five auricular points and maybe they're all special and you know from god chosen and so on and so forth but no i think it was this you know sort of electro volts of minor pain for a second that opened up the frontal cortex in, in, in your way of looking at it. But what, no, I think it's because they were in a tribe. Yeah. They're in, they were in the tribe. Okay. There were other people around on the same track. And I, even for five minutes, those mirror neurons are like, Oh, what, what do these people do? Oh, they don't do drugs. Okay. Well, we won't do drugs. Oh, they do acupuncture. Okay. Well, we'll do acupuncture. You yep. were engaging those mirror neurons. Yeah, it's interesting. That was back in the 90s. I don't know where that is now, but it was a big movement of what they call it. They called it detox acupuncture for whatever reason. Fantastic. But, Super yeah. fantastic. And do you think, I, I bet it really helped them stay sober. Oh, did it, oh work? it did. It was, it, was, it, yeah. it, was, it was jaw-dropping to saying, so why does it work for him? And I know his history. And for that guy, he's a, if it, you know, I'm going to say famous attorney, but this is where his life is. And he's probably doing his coke because he can afford it. And he's in that fast moving lane and he's now trying to get away from that. And so you'd see this context thing. I just don't get it, but it's working, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Humans are humans are humans. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, oh, I'm so glad you did that, Carl. That, that's, it is. That's so that's why, maybe that's why I was so- Got to see a different side of people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, you realize it's not, it's not all just take this way, add this, here's your supplements, go on and so on and so forth. So into the food side of thing, I was sort of looking for an overlap. I got so habituated with, like, with well, processed food, but that was a big list. You know, I, I take the more grieving things out of their diets, but it was basically boiled down to, and I would basically say, anybody could do what I'm doing if they told their best go down the street and tell people not to eat wheat and not to eat dairy they'll see amazing improvement i mean it was so obvious that they were disproportionately in relative to food that that was the thing get it off their plate give them that consciousness we'll say after the three or four days you're saying do you have a hierarchy in your mind of most egregious most addictive most or do you say you know you gotta just take this whole ball of wax toss it and and stay away from it for four days till the cravings go away, or or do you look at somebody? Do you go there by even saying so? What do you eat in the course of the day? Do you open that up? Or- stay with us. We'll be right back. If you have questions about food and farming, check out Ask a Farmer. 
We share information about Canadian-grown food from dietitians, food experts, farmers, and those involved in the agriculture industry. Explore how your food is grown and raised and get useful information to help you make confident food choices at the grocery store. I'm your host, Clinton Monchak, a Canadian farmer. You can listen to the Ask a Farmer podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. Super excellent core question. How do you get started? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's a started. How do you get started? So, I mean, first of all, people who come into the ARC, they seem to be to be able to get started pretty darn quickly. Now, they might lapse for a long time while they're building that frontal lobe right. mirror neuron axis. So the big deal is that you're getting that mirror neuron to, front, to support the frontal lobe instead of supporting the craving pathways. So when you're watching advertisements, the mirror neurons are stimulating craving pathways. But when, when you're in a support meeting, the mirror neurons are, are stimulating frontal lobe. Huge shift. So a person who's got that kind of mental power, they can move through the elimination list, you know, really steadily. So I have a, a list. It's called the excluded list. It's on a website called Food Addiction Resources. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there's like 23 handouts there, and we've just started to put them up at our own website, Food Addiction Reset. They're a little bit more accessible at food addiction reset, so I would go there. So you, you get the excluded list, and what I say to people is, first of all, you have got to go slow. Before I'll even show them the list, I say you've got to go slow. This is, you're going to build a new lifestyle. You're not going to just go in for one one-hour appointment and get a whole brand new lifestyle that you just put on. Mm -hmm. No, right. you, you're going to, this all requires tremendous skill development, and as long as you're in a good program and you're getting lots of support, you will make progress. The more hours that you spend in the video chats, the faster it will go. But don't worry about how fast you're going. You're in a safe place now. You've got expert support. You will get on top of this. And then there are around people who we've now been doing this a year and a half. So there are lots of people in there who have conquered food, who never had control of food in their entire lives from toddlerhood. So we know it works. So that just that level of reassurance, just like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry anymore. So you, so now you're reducing stress, which is reducing cravings. Yeah, so you just, um, but I say do the one that's easiest. If you're already not doing soy, uh, good, check that one off, you know, do a little celebration <laughs> dance. Great, I'm not doing soy. I got my first one. Mm -hmm. And if the next one is dried fruit, uh -huh, yeah, woo, I got two. So keep that celebratory tone up, 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 because they're in a battle. It's a daily battle. Yep. You're battling the food industry. You're battling the food addiction that's in everybody around you. Um, it's a battle every day. It's like getting into a boxing ring and your sparring partner is much more powerful than you and you get down, knocked down a lot at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then gradually you learn the moves and now there comes the day when you knock down the sparring partner because you have training. It's training, it's training, it's training. It's not opening a book and turning to the diet and, you no. know, a diet you, you you've yeah so in given that you spoke uh twice and you'll be speaking more at the low carb and i'm sure other related conferences that you know uh low carb high fat keto where do you sort of register on that because you ended up with um i love the uh courage for lack of a better word uh that you present you know at the end because you're tell your story and you're wrapping up and you go, <laughs> he said, don't hate me for this. <laughs> and suddenly pause. Everybody's watching. She says, don't hate. We just, we just fell in love with this person. It's all this great information. And she says, and says, don't hate me for this. It's like, everybody zooms in to listen. And then you said, I was wondering if you treated, if you traded, you know, sugar addiction for 
fat addiction or dairy. I can't remember if you had dairy in there, but it was the sugar for the fat. And I go, wow, I love it. You know, I mean, just to challenge the audience. So it's not like I'm leading you, you know, these are your next little five things to do. I mean, there's part of that is, is certainly they should follow what you're saying. So I, I come back and I'm asking, it's like, because it's, you know, everybody's on eat high fat and get your ketones there. And that's going to balance your blood sugar. And that's why we measure your glucose and ketones and your A1C and ideally insulin as well. Um, so where are you on that? Because you fit in, but in one way you're saying, that's secondary, you know, it's good. <laughs> but the real issue is way up front here. Yeah. So I'm actually, uh, you could probably advise me on this. Um, I have, so the food plan we use is by definition low carb. When you take a pound of sugar, flour, French fries out of somebody's yeah, food right. plan, right. you've reduced carbs. It's just, there's two facts that go together here. One, Americans eat almost twice the number of calories they need. Right. And the other one is they're eating a pound per person per day of these highly addictive carbohydrates, right. never mind dairy fat. And so um, when you extract that, the, the sugar flour french fries it, compared to the to the people who are still using that right. you've you've hit low carb by comparison by comparison that's interesting yeah. so you're almost saying actually by default if you take that out it happens to be carb i'm not you know it's just take take out the carbs i'm saying take out the carbs because they're garbage and they're processed food whatever category you want to put it in by default you'll be at a high fat low carb diet More no no, okay. No, you'll be at a low carb diet. I'm sorry. Compared to mainstream yeah. America, compared to everybody else, you're you're now officially low carb. Right. So in the food plan that I've used over the years, um, just doing that much is enough for 90% of people to achieve the results that I hear talked about in the keto con the low carb conferences. Yeah. So that's why I, you know, I will stand up there and don't hate me, but it could be that most of the benefit is from taking out the processed foods right. and not from the fact that you've gone high fat, low carb, you know, that's interesting. Just, you know don't hate me. <laughs> but, no, I think it's, so, I, I, no, you made them more honest. So we're not always saying the same thing in that regard. I find. Well, so here's, I, I love the low carb community. I love the keto community for the big reason that they do take people off all those refined carbohydrates. They're, they, that community and the food addiction community, the two communities that get it, you go off, you stay off. Right. So that's, you know, I belong. I belong in that keto community because I'm all about, um, you know, the, the toxic effects of those processed carbs. Right. So what I would like to do is reframe my food plan. Yeah. So my food plan has unrefined starches on it, seven ounces of vegetables, four ounces of, I, I prefer animal protein. Okay, don't hate me for that either. And then two teaspoons of fat, two teaspoons of a cold pressed, um, like an olive oil or animal fat or, or just a really healthy fat. And, um, and with that food plan, I get the same results that you guys are talking about in keto. Mm -hmm. not the seizures okay for seizures right. you have to do the the very high levels of fat and it works incredibly and in fact it's part of the story that i didn't tell is that i developed seizures during my doctoral program and i used that extreme keto to make them stop i, oh. I fixed my own seizures well with the help of a couple of great doctors yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah. So I, I want to reframe my food plan as either like bridge keto or a keto light uh, or something that I can that I can get a comfort level in the keto community with this as a transitional food plan. Right. Because I also know if you have a food addict, the more foods you can leave them with, the, the greater progress they're able to make. So if they, if they know that they can still have sweet potatoes, you know, it's got to be with four ounces of protein and seven ounces of vegetables and two teaspoons of fat, yep. they're more likely to be able to move forward. 
Interesting. So you, you know, you all of that, and you say, oh, you're only going to have animal protein, some vegetables, and a lot of fat. They, um, I, I don't think, I mean, I think that's harder. It's interesting. So I wouldn't, in me trying to look at all the little details, I go, I would love to see, I love, I love blood work. I mean, that's was, you know, and so you would love to see the glucose, ketones, whatever, you know, it's just sort of see how that in this population, but what you, what you just said almost is very Atkins esque. And so we're, um, I think we, we have that as kind of just a generic word out there now, but when I was up with Dr. Westman, you know, this is what he has right from, I was looking for the handout, the shorter one, he calls page four now, which was, you know, you know Dr. Atkins sort of gave him this, you know, 20 page thumper in a way. And page four was exactly what he said. It was primarily focused on green leafy vegetables. I think he had some starches in there, but he said it might've been two tablespoons of fat, but he really sort of kept the fat down. It didn't say high fat, you know, here it is. And, you know, he had it measured by fistfuls and so on, but it was, it's a measurement. And mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, you know, go nuts with the, with the, uh, the protein, but that was it. It was a measured transition. So when I looked at that, it certainly had its carbs in there and they were under 20 technically. I mean, that was his, his goal. And, that's, and so it was all stuffed in there, but that's how it was. Here's, you know, tried to not have a lot of the starchy root vegetables, mostly the leaf, green leafy, but it wasn't, and go have a lot of fat because you're going to get in ketosis and you're going to force feed your body into using fat first. He goes, no, I just, just have that. So you're yeah. working from the side, as we said, kind of by default, working from the carb side of the equation yeah. and getting him to, that place and, and there'll be a fat burner by default um well, I'm, I'm really working from the toxins from these are not foods these are addictive toxic substances yeah yeah okay that that's my framework there yep. and um the the piece about this is that you want people to do this for the rest of their lives which means they do also you want them to look as much like other people as possible mm -hmm. because they will attract less flack from other people and they're sensitive to flack they're sensitive to criticism they're sensitive to being singled out you know they've got massive lifelong shame issues uh not their fault but it's another you know it's it's because of those craving pathways are also the feel good pathways Mm -hmm. And what happens over time is you keep getting these floods of dopamine, serotonin, opiate, uh, and their cannabinoids, but the receptors close down. So you're getting these floods, but you're not feeling good anymore. Right. You're getting these floods, you're losing your frontal lobe. You, you have this unbelievable urge to go get this stuff. Locomotion, stress, all working great to get you to go get it. But you don't like it anymore, and it's not doing anything for you. Right. So the shame, so in the default of I feel good about myself, there is shame and it's powerful and it will, it's crippling. So I, I also think it's great if people can look like other people as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you have a big pile of vegetables on your plate and a starch and a protein and you're drizzling your fat, your olive oil over that, you look like other people. Now, you might still attract, oh, you eat so healthy. Like, oh, well, yes, I do. <laughs> but but we can train people on how to respond to that. You know, thanks for noticing. Yeah, I really do. Yep, yep, working on it. So, so yeah. In, in yeah, your learning. Are, so what I, and then the other thing I hear in these keto conferences is that the health professionals are not able to get their institutions on board because, oh, high fat, that'll kill the heart, blah, blah, blah which we know thanks to Ivor Cummins is not true. Right. So um, Ivor and Dave and um, Dave, Dave Feldman and the guy, uh, shoot, David Diamond. Mm -hmm. So those were brilliant presentations at the last low carb conference. So we know that high fat does not give you heart disease, but um, nonetheless, I think that health professionals could sell to their institutions a recommendation not to use processed foods, like in a heartbeat, excuse the pun. So I, I think, so that's why I want to position 
this what I call clean food plan or unprocessed food plan mm -hmm. as I, I want to get that on the keto spectrum. I want to call it like, you know, bridge keto or beginner keto or keto light or I, I want to get this on the keto spectrum. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think I have a chance? Well, you have results that are, are and it results everything. You know, and so you're doing it and you're creating results and it's a, a stunning true. So I think you can, um, if, if you're, look, you're asking kind of how do you put yourself into the commercial world, which anything with keto on it will sell to some dummy out there. And that's kind of unfortunate. And I think it will work, but you're looking for a different audience than just somebody who's going to go out and buy exogenous ketones because they think they're going to lose weight. Right. Um, right. right. So, I, so I do think that, um, I always think that... <clears throat> Two things. One is uh, you look at hospitals and how much money do they actually get by their associations for all these processed food, by the vending machines and oh, so on and so forth. There's well, no, I mean, they're, they're core business. As, they, as, right. you know, what is it? Eighty percent of what's going on in the health community is diet related. So, for taking something away, how can we even? You know, I've long since given up on the idea that hospitals and insurance companies and most of medicine is based on having people be healthier. That's naive. I'm sorry. I mean, or cynical, however you want to look at it. And yeah. so um, in their environment is how can we replace that? So they'll now see it as a profit center. And in addition to being healthy, <laughs> you know, in addition to duh, being healthy um, there, there, I can see things like coalitions and so on and so forth, you know, you know, the whole grass getting behind it because it's a truthful application that's working. Um, the other thing is when I see a lot of research is led by money, you know, exogenous ketones is leading the way because it's a pharmaceutical, now it's a pharmaceutical thing that can be patented and you get returns on it. You know, uh, by comparison, I'm big into C8, but you've, you've been listening to you make me think a lot of things, um, is that it's, it's cheap and it's the alternative. Nobody's going to look into it. Just, just comparing those two properties. And it's like, that's how it is. And so that's the model that drives a lot of who gives what that's, what drove the Saturday mornings, you know, they weren't about health, they, they were about money. Um, so in that, I think that you're connected with a, a high quality audience and in essence, uh, overall, your message is about food quality. I mean, if I was even enlarge it, right? So you're saying, I want to talk about food quality and you take a whole different take. Most people go, oh, let me tell you, it's the, it's the grass, you know, it's the free range grass fed beef. Yeah. No, it's not that, it, but it, it, it sort of shares that concept. And so you have a better concept to talk about that uh, doesn't, have, doesn't have to make one go out and have all the gourmet uh, expensive foods. No. no. So I think that will yeah. work. I, but yeah, so I think you found your audience. Um, the pesticides and herbicides. And it, I have finally, after many years, agreed that um, going organic is really crucial. Oh, yeah. I'm listening to Emran Mayer's book right now, The Gut-Brain Connection. Uh -huh. And um, you can't, you, can't, oh, you can't mess with that. It. You cannot mess with that gut micro. <laughs> you just microbiome no. has got to be intact and functioning, and to have a happy person. And we do know that these pesticides and herbicides Clearly. are killing our Clearly. gut microbes. So this is the only part of my old uh, post medical education was on environmental medicine. So there's separate certification. So not just heavy metals, but when you start looking at the pesticides, you go, oh my gosh, you know, and it, it, it's, it, it's enough to make you stab yourself, <laughs> you oh, know. And you're just like, what else could they do to beat up millions right. of people, hundreds of millions of people? And now with the move into cannabis, I'm just like, oh, no, I agree. I, burden on these people who are already so burdened with addictions. I agree. I, I came out of Bastyr, as you know, and that was sort of a real plant-based orientation. I mean, that was how it was when I was in the late 90s. And kind of what I like about carnivore without saying I just eat you know, the whole ancestral diet thing is like, look what I just got them off of, all those pesticides. <laughs> That's how, so even though the argument is of phytonutrients and say, yeah, we can talk about oxalates and phytates, and, but without getting there, it's like what I really got you off from are all those pesticides. Because yeah. as much as you yeah. might want to have organic, but you really don't have organic, even if you do the, you know, the, the dirty dozen and all that other stuff, you're still having your daily dose of, of pesticides. And if I can stop that, I can improve your life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is research that was done by Chris Gardner at um, Stanford, where he took a lot of different food plans and 
any food plan that did not have processed foods on it worked. Humans are incredibly adaptable. We know that the Eskimos have not eaten a plant for generation after generation. Not why are they getting their vitamins? Because the sea animals, they ate, ate the kelp off the ocean floor. Right, right. And that's where your, your vitamins were. But yeah, humans are incredibly adaptable to a lot of different diets. But what they're not adaptable to at all is toxins. <laughs> And no, that's what these, these pseudo foods, they're not foods, they're, they're drug, they're drug food like substances. Yes. yes. Uh, we're not adapted to that and they will poison us and we will never be not poisoned by them. And every time we put them back in on a clean system, they will poison us again. So yep. it's piercing that delusion. This is about the substances. And I, it's just like you can, you, you can see it. When you compare it to smoking, so you know every cigarette is toxic, every cigarette is harmful, whether you have it once a year or once an hour, each and every time it hurts you. And you're not smoking because of your childhood issues, you're smoking because you're being exposed to acute addictive substance. So right. nobody ever says, Oh, that person, they have emotional smoking. No, they have an addiction to nicotine or yep. they're smoking because of their childhood issues. Yeah, so right, right. They do a couple of years of intense therapy. Uh, no, they have, their brain is adapted to nicotine. Uh, it's just like it, when you can cut through it, yep. you know, oh, their brain is adapted to sugar. Oh, their brain is adapted to gluteomorphines. Oh, their brain is adapted to, you know, tisomorphines then you see exactly what to do. I hear get you. Get away from the queuing and get their food, get the toxic substances out of their food. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time. And that is our product of C8 Keto MCT oil. How is it different and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7%. Caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind our C8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, and that is all three ketones your beta hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there, they come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia, and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid, we put a little bit in our coffee, we make our mayonnaise out of it, we make uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast, it's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis, as along with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best, and I thought you should know.